No Credits Roll. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 3 of No Credits Rolled, a show where we play the games and sometimes we even finish them. My name is Sam Whalen and today we've got some news stories for you and my thoughts on some games I've been playing lately. Uh, a couple things I want to hit off the top. This is episode 3 and we are making this up as we go along. Uh, but we are up on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, so if you are listening through that service, I appreciate it. If you're not, go check it out. You can just search No Credits Rolled and we'll be there for you. Uh, go subscribe, leave a review if you can. It does help us out. Um, I want to shout out my friends. I know they've been doing that. So thanks. Uh, we're we're shaping this fan base one click at a time. Uh, also, our Patreon is up, if you're feeling generous. Uh, for just $5 a month, you can subscribe and recommend games for me to play and talk about. Uh, so thank you for listening. Either way, uh, whether you do the Patreon, Apple, Spotify, wherever you're listening, I, of course, always appreciate it. All right, let's get into the news for this week. Uh, this actually broke yesterday as of the date we are recording this. Uh, I only had one story for the show, but then, you know, Disney came in and gave me something else to talk about. So Disney buys a $1.5 billion stake in Epic Games to create an, ex- quote, expansive universe within Fortnite. Now, I don't know if I've talked about it a lot on this show, but I'm a pretty big fan of Fortnite, folks, okay? I enjoy Fortnite. Um, I'm proud to say it. I'm proud to say it. Um, <laughs> I know it's a children's game, but I enjoy it. Uh, but yes, Disney is now has a $1.5 billion stake in Epic um, this is from Adam Bankhurst over at IGN, quote, Disney has purchased a $1.5 billion stake in Epic Games and teamed up with the company to develop a new expansive, open, persistent, and social universe that will interoperate with Fortnite and let fans, this is a quote within a quote from Disney, uh, play, watch, shop, and engage. I'll never let you guess what the most important of those four things is. Play, watch, shop, and engage with their favorite characters and stories from Disney, Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, Avatar, and more. Uh, I don't know about you, but I personally always forget that Disney uh, owns Avatar. I know they have, like, Avatar World in Animal Kingdom, but I'm not a big Disney World fan, personally. Um, I have been playing that Avatar game, but not enough to talk about it on the show yet. So maybe in the coming weeks we'll get uh, my thoughts on that, but... Yeah, uh, Disney, Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, Avatar, and more. So this is a pretty big deal, I think. Disney doesn't really have a footprint in the world of gaming until now. Uh, They Obviously, they dominate in movies and television. But they haven't really, you know, staked a claim in the world of gaming until now with Epic. And it makes sense, right? I mean, we've seen collaborations with Epic before, uh, through Fortnite specifically, with things like the... You know, there's been Star Wars events. There was a whole Marvel season that I personally really enjoyed. I thought it was very well done. They've had lightsabers in the game. You know, Disney properties have been in Fortnite. Uh, So this is, you know, it makes sense. Not to mention Fortnite is a cash cow. If you're you're Disney, you want your brand associated with something already lucrative and successful. You know, it's unlikely they're going to go to a a small indie startup and say, here's $1.5 billion, make us a game. No, they're going to partner with an equivalent juggernaut in the games industry, and that's exactly what Epic is. So, yeah, I mean, we're going to see what comes of this. Uh, People were joking that it's going to be Disney Infinity 2, which, hey, I like Disney Infinity. It wasn't that bad. You know, it, it was another children's game that required you to buy those small figures. But I thought the actual game itself had a lot of potential. And I think if they give it over to Fortnite, it's going to be the exact same thing where... It's like that sandbox, because in Fortnite now, it's not just that Battle Royale mode or the the mode it came out with, (laughs) uh, Save the World. It's essentially turned into its own game factory, kind of like Roblox, another children's game that makes a ton of money. There's all kinds of custom modes in Fortnite, and Fortnite itself has made games within it, like the main stage, which is the Rock Band mode, uh, Lego Fortnite, and the Rocket Racing, which is the Rocket League collab. So... Epic has shown that they can use this game to make more games. Now, that being said, I do think there is still that Fortnite integration in those examples. Like, you're still playing as your Fortnite skins in main stage in Lego Fortnite. They're Legoized. Ver- That's not a word. Legoized. We're going to stick with it. Versions of your Fortnite skins. And then in Rocket Racing, they did a whole thing with Rocket League now because they're all under the Epic banner. They still have that um, Fortnite 
feel to it and that Fortnite lens. So I'm curious what Disney's going to do with that going forward with their vision. If they're maybe going to, I don't know, make a virtual Disney World or something that you can run around in. I don't know. I think the, the possibilities are definitely there. And I do think it's exciting as a fan of these things. I would like to be Woody in Fortnite if I can. Um, but they're also going to make a boatload of money. I mean, let's be honest. The the shop, if we get, you know, Disney skins or something in Fortnite, more of them, I think that's that's going to, you know, it's a license to print money. And it does make you wonder, is this just the beginning for Disney? Are they going to start taking bigger leaps into the gaming genre? Uh, maybe partnering with other studios? Uh, you know, I know there's the, um, what was the name of that game? Well, there's Disney Dreamlight Valley, which is a partnership with Gameloft. Uh, I did forget about that one, but you know, that's an example of a, it's like a animal crossing kind of game, a cozy game as it's being called. So that is one example. Gameloft is pretty big. Uh, they're mostly known for mobile games, but so that is one example, but I was more thinking like a, a big triple a, maybe single player, multiplayer thing. I don't know what you would do with Disney. I'm probably, you're probably listening and screaming at your, your speaker, something obvious, but maybe something through Pixar or. Any of those things, I think the potential is definitely there. And then the other one that came out last year was Disney Illusion Island. And that was a really cool-looking 2D platformer, kind of Metroidvania thing. Uh, I didn't get a chance to play it, but all the previews I saw, it looked very interesting. It's using that new animation style they've been using for the Mickey Mouse cartoon, I believe. Uh, And I think it was pitched as, like, your first introduction to the Metroidvania genre. Uh, and I think that's great. I think that's really creative. And like I said, I, looking at some of the gameplay, I do think that it definitely has, you know, mass appeal there if you're into that genre. But again, like I said, I would like a AAA, something of that caliber. Uh, there was a game a couple years ago. I believe it was called Kana Bridge of Spirits. Yes, from Ember Lab. Uh, and when that game came out, everybody compared it to Pixar. And the game is beautiful. I played a little bit of it. I started it, but I I didn't get very far because other things came up. But that game visually is very, very impressive, and it does kind of look like a Pixar movie. So I could totally see them doing something in that universe with that Pixar animation style with one of their Pixar properties in conjunction with this investment into Epic. They announced Moana 2. I think there's potential there for, you know, any of their, a lot of those uh, Pixar movies could be adapted into some kind of game, however you want to do it. Yeah, we're going to see what happens. They're definitely going to make a lot of money. And I'm not sure we got a timetable on when all this stuff is going to come out. But, you know, you got to imagine it's in the next, what, five to ten years at least. And this is unrelated to gaming. I know that uh, ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers are going to make their own streaming service. Uh, And two of those are owned by Disney, or at least, you know, majority owned by Disney. Uh, So that's a pretty big deal. So, you know, Disney is clearly making big moves here in the entertainment business. Uh, and I think that this gaming portion of it is is going to be a pretty foundational pillar going forward because like I said at the top of the story, Disney doesn't really have that big tentpole presence that you're, you would expect from Disney, right? They're Disney. <laughs> they, they're, they're dominating with the MCU, or they were for a while, uh, in television and movies, and, and they have Star Wars. So you're kind of waiting for that game on the Disney side of things, as I'm working this out verbally, I know we've got Star Wars Outlaws, and obviously we have Star Wars games. That's not really what I meant, though. You know, I I know we've got Star Wars games. It's the rest of Disney that we don't really see that AAA-level game quality come out with. And again, maybe you're listening and thinking, Sam, how are you forgetting X game? So yeah, I'm curious to see where this will go, and uh, I hope we get Cool Fortnite skins, because boy, do I love Fortnite skins. Anyway, speaking of live service games, let's move on to story number two. Live service games and the Suicide Squad killed the Justice League reviews. This is kind of a two-parter here that I wanted to cover. Uh, This is a quick article from gamesindustry.biz. Jeffrey Rousseau there, he says, quote, A new report from Griffin Gaming Partners says that 95% of game makers are developing or maintaining a live service game. Uh, I did a little bit of digging. Griffin Gaming Partners, they're an investor group, and they focus, this is from their website, on, quote, gaming startups of all stages 
from pre-seed to pre-IPO. I don't know what those words mean, but it sounded very official and very legit. Uh, It just seems like they're an investor group, so they would have a lot of data on this. So yeah, 95% of game makers, that's a lot of game makers, are developing or maintaining a live service game. And this comes more from Rousseau's article. Among the surveyors, 66% agree that live services are necessary for long-term title success. Uh, For the purpose of the survey, they're defining live service as any regular update cadence plan for a game. So they're a little loosey-goosey with the definition there, and that might be why it's 95% of game makers. But still, I think most games that are very successful now are fitting that that, um, that definition of regular updates planned for a game. Sure, when every game comes out, they're going to have regular updates. So, you know, you could take it with a grain of salt. That being said, there are still a ton of live service games that are being released and are going to be released. And, you know, we, we have to wonder where is that going to take the gaming landscape going forward, right? Is that going to be the future of gaming We've moved away from the loot box uh, trend, the good old days of Battlefront 2 and and Overwatch and gambling regulations (laughs) and worrying about children gambling. And we've moved on to now live services where, you know, we're dealing in virtual currencies and games that come out and are never, quote, finished or done. You know, a lot of games aren't coming out as a complete package. They're, They're being updated and patched as they go. Um... And there's the downside of live service games where you can be really into a game and if it's a live service that needs to be constantly online, within two to three months if the game fails, you just can't play it anymore because they turn the servers off. <laughs> um, so that's a bummer. Uh, I have later on in this some of my favorite live service games because it is a genre that I do really enjoy. You know, it's it's endless content if you can turn your brain off and not think about the fact that you're kind of you know a hamster in a wheel not necessarily working towards any end goal but you know in this case it's the journey not the destination you're having fun along the way if you enjoy the the game itself but talking more about uh the trials and tribulations of live service games this is an article from game informer in 2023 uh from wesley leblanc he says quote sony announced it was acquiring destiny 2 maker bungie for 3.6 billion dollars in january of 2022 A week later, in a quarterly financial results briefing, Sony CFO Hiroki Totoki, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that name, revealed that PlayStation planned to launch more than 10 live service games by March 2026. Uh, He goes on to, LeBlanc goes on to say, Totoki stated that of its 12 live service games, it will only release six by the fiscal year 2025, which of course ends in March 2026, and that's from Video Games Chronicle. So, this was a hot button issue around the time that Sony acquired Bungie because everybody who said, okay, well, Bungie makes Destiny 2. That's one of the biggest live service games out there. Sony's trying to cash in on that trend. And when you're talking live service games, Destiny 2 is one of the biggest ones. It's, you know, it kind of pulled itself up from somewhat disaster uh, from Destiny 1 and Destiny 2's launch. It, Definitely got it together, and obviously now we're seeing peaks and valleys with it as well with each expansion. Uh, I've been playing Destiny since day one of the original game, so I'm biased, I guess. But it's undeniable that Bungie is going to be one of the people you go to for an opinion on how to make a live service game, regardless of the quality of current Destiny 2. I mean, Destiny 2 is still... It's, you know, still active. It's not necessarily thriving like it was maybe six to eight months ago, but it's still on. His servers are still on, (laughs) which with a live service game is, you know, always a plus. So there was the rumored Last of Us Factions game that was going to be turned into its own video game, uh, the spinoff of the Last of Us multiplayer from the first game, and that was in development for ages. Um, But eventually, and I neglected to be a journalist and get quotes for this, but I'll just recall what I can, Sony called in Bungie to basically look over the in-development Factions game, and Bungie basically, you know, poo-pooed it and said, this isn't going to cut it, so Sony scaled it back pretty aggressively, and now 
what, what's it been one or two months since we saw that factions game get totally canned. Um, so Bungie came in, basically gave it the F rating, and before we knew it, that thing got scrapped. So it, it really shows that one, Sony's taking what Bungie says very seriously when it comes to these things, and two, if there is a potential for failure, Sony's not even going to want to you know go forward with it, which sucks for all the people that worked on that and were working on that when it got canned. So yeah, I mean, this is from last year, but according to this, they've got uh, from the CFO six uh, games, six live service games by 2026. And assuming they, you know, they're still going to go forward with those. So there is still that large portion of their, their marketing and their brand focus going forward that is going to be on live service games. You know, who's to say if Bungie comes in and, and, gets those canned too who knows um but it makes you wonder if the industry is moving away from live service games i definitely don't think so i I think they just make way too much money to to abandon that model and you know i'm not a game developer i don't know how that works in terms of development if you're constantly working and pushing out updates i mean i know there's crunch is a big issue that gets called out a lot and I can't help but feel like this live service development cycle, you know, crunch may be a factor if you're constantly having to push out these updates, especially something like a Fortnite, where you're pushing out updates like every two weeks. Um, I don't, maybe it's not as extreme as it used to be with that game, but, you know, and maybe you've got a rotating staff. Like I said, I, I'm not, I don't have the insider information for that. Um, but it, 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 you run the risk of it for sure. Speaking of profit, this is from a Game World Observer. In Q2 fiscal year 24, Electronic Arts reached 1.1 or sorry, 1.91 billion dollars in net revenue, which is up 0.5% year over year, and live services accounted for 67.5% of that or 1.29 billion. Now EA is like the maybe the golden goose when it comes to these live service games, you know, with things like Madden and FIFA and UFC. Every sports game that EA puts out is essentially a live service because they're marketing the online uh, aspect of those games, which you can buy booster packs for, and they're being updated hypothetically. Um, So they're going to make a killing, right? Uh, That also includes Apex Legends, which is like one of the biggest battle royales still, and another one of my favorites. So a lot of EAs and, you know, games are coming out as live services. So that explains why 67.5% of their revenue was accounted for from them. But there are those examples where it's not as successful and they do fail. I mean, you had Knockout City, which was a big one that I liked. That got turned off. Um, I'm trying to think. Of, oh, there was, um, what was that wrestling one called? Knockout, Knockout KO, something like that. Rumbleverse. Rumbleverse shut down after only like six months of being a thing. That's another one that got turned off. So, you know, it's tough. It's tough for the consumer, for someone that might, like, fall in love with these games. Like, I really enjoyed Knockout City, only to have it get turned off. I can't even imagine what it's like as a developer, you know, to finally see the fruit of your labors, only to have it squandered so quickly, and for you to just really have no say in it. So it's certainly, it seems like a real boom or bust kind of thing, right? Where you're either making, what did EA make? 1.29 1.29 billion from their live service games or you're getting turned off after six months. It really seems like there's very few examples of that kind of middle of the road. You've got your juggernauts in the battle royale genre, your apexes, your fortnights, your war zones, and those make a killing. No pun intended. But, you know, for your smaller live service game, it, it's tough to get that fan base and it's tough to sustain, tough to sustain it. But that brings us to... The second half of this story that I wanted to cover, uh, that's sort of the most recent AAA live service attempt uh, in Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. This is, of course, from the creators of the Arkham Batman series, Rocksteady. It's a live service co-op looter shooter starring the Suicide Squad and a mind-controlled Justice League where you have to kill them all. Um, you're not playing as the Justice League. You're, you're, you're hunting them down. Now, right off the bat, that's uh, a tough sell <laughs> for a lot of comic book fans or, you know, DC fans, I'll say, because there's the movies and the shows and all that. It's a tough sell when you're saying, okay, we're giving you a Justice League game, kind of. 
Uh, you don't get to play as any of the Justice League members. Uh, you get to play as the Suicide Squad. And I feel like, and maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like the Suicide Squad is always a hard sell, despite the fact that Warner Brothers keeps returning to that well. Uh, I thought the James Gunn movie was pretty good. Great, even. I thought the other Suicide Squad movie was not good. And they have varying appearances in the animated universe that are fine. I've never personally seen much of it. I think they were in either Justice League or Justice League Unlimited. They were in the Arrow show, kind of. I don't know. They they just show up a lot. They're, it's just something that they go to. They're kind of like DC's equivalent of like a... I don't even know what to... It's not like the Avengers of the X-Men, because those are, those are pretty big. The Suicide Squad is like... I don't know. I don't know. They go to the well a lot is the point. So when the game got announced, and this is before gameplay even came out, just when the concept came out, people were like, okay, so we're kind of on board because it's Rocksteady's making another DC game. It's I think the initial trailer showed the Suicide Squad and that it was in Metropolis and that they're killing the Justice League who have been mind-controlled. And we're like, oh, okay, um... Sure, maybe. And then the gameplay trailer comes out, and everybody <laughs> takes a the not everybody, the majority of people are very disappointed by this gameplay reveal because it shows that the game is not going to be a single player focused action game like Arkham. It's going to be a looter shooter live service co op um, nightmare. And you know, obviously, that's my opinion, but. You can look at gameplay now of the game that it's out, uh, and it's really uh, visually noisy. That's just a fact. Like, there's so much going on screen. You're like, it's very hard to follow. Um, and uh, like I said, it's also a looter shooter. It's a live service game. Uh, not what people wanted, to say the least. Definitely not what people of the Arkham fans of the Arkham games wanted. They did not want that. Um, as a fan of the Arkham games, that is not what I wanted from Rocksteady. I'm not sure who did. Uh, now, I will say that it's probably part of this trend of live service games that they thought, well, hey, we can milk this cash cow for as long as we need to if we make it a live service game, right? We can, you know, and that's exactly what they're doing, by the way. They have a content roadmap already lined up. That's how all these games work. Will we see that roadmap fulfilled? Hey, we can ask Marvel's Avengers, but... the <sighs> People were very disappointed, but now that the game is out, we're getting reviews for it, and they're primarily negative. Uh, the game seems to have lived up to those low expectations. Uh, this is from Matthew Jackson over at Game Rant, quote, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League received lukewarm reviews and has a lower player count on Steam compared to other superhero games. The game's Metacritic score of 62 is significantly lower than the highly acclaimed Arkham Trilogy titles. Rocksteady Studios is planning to release DLC, and seasons for the game, but the low player count on Steam raises concerns about the game's future. Which is exactly what I was saying. And it's sort of that boomer bust thing we talked about with live service games. If these things fail, it's harder to fulfill that content roadmap. I do think, you know, it's a little weird. It's tough to compare it to the Arkham games. It's like, it almost is like apples and oranges, right? I don't know if you guys remember Gotham Knights when that game came out. That was a similar action co-op live service thing that didn't really get followed up on. I think they might have already ceased updates on it. They did like one update for multiplayer, but it's another thing where it's we're banking on the property to carry it forward, but the gameplay is not what people want. Uh, another thing about Suicide Squad, Paul Tassi at Forbes Quote, the game peaked at 13,459 players on Saturday, February 3rd, despite it being the full weekend after its release. That figure is lower than Marvel's Avengers, 31,000, I'm rounding here, and significantly lower than Destiny 2's 300,000 peak players. So already the game had a rough start. And I do think a lot of that is probably just because, like, they showed the game and the majority of people didn't want it or weren't excited for it. That, and I don't even have it in the show notes here, but they were charging $100 for an early access version where you could play the game like three days early. 
and then there was a bug, so they had to take it down. The so the people that bought that hundred dollar version couldn't even utilize the full time of that early access. So it's like just right off the bat, you're you're going in with a, a trepidatious fan base, and then you're immediately you know <laughs> making a mistake like that that already hurts your your brain and your vision that already looks kind of rough. And that being said, there are some positives. Again, I haven't played it yet. I this is the maybe the dirty secret of this whole pot this whole section of this podcast. I want to play this game, folks. It looks like something I would enjoy. I, am I proud to say that? Not really, but it's true. Now I already said it's not the game I wanted from Rocksteady, but it's the game we got. And I do enjoy these looter shooter endless grind games. And I do want to play this game. I just don't want to pay seventy plus dollars for it with tax because it's probably going to get discounted judging by the performance. Uh, that being said, some of the positives people have said, the graphical performance looks great. I've been watching people play through it, so this is, I guess, my review of what they're playing. So take it with a grain of salt if you want. Uh, the game certainly doesn't look cheap. It's got a very high production value. All the animations, the character animations, the presentation looks fantastic. Uh, it's really the gameplay that looks the most boring and repetitive. It looks like it's just go here, shoot these things, go here, guard this thing. You know, it's your standard affair for these live service, you know, looter shooters. And that's not a lot of people's cup of tea. It is my cup of tea, though. Um, I've played a lot of these kind of games. I was a big Avengers fan. Like I said earlier, I'm a big Destiny 2 fan. I played a lot of the Borderlands games. I just enjoy the the gameplay loop of a lot of these live service games. Um, and I was a diehard Avengers fan for a while until they, you know, delisted it. But it's the plight of a live service game defender, I'll tell you what. And I can see Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League going the same way of Avengers, where, you know, maybe it's supported for a little while, but within a year it might just kind of fade away. Unless they make significant changes to the gameplay or add a character that people like, or, you know, say all the Justice League were clones and then we get a game with them or something. Something like that. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do. And I'm also, I have no idea how much money they're making, but it seems like the game is exactly what people were expecting it to be. And that's for better or worse. And so that kind of brings us back to what I was talking about before with the future of this live service model and the viability of it with studios and developers going forward. Did Rocksteady want to make a live service game or was that just the pitch because it's what is currently the hot trend and what can make you a lot of money? I guarantee you if they made a, I mean, if they made another Batman Arkham game that was actually legit like the other ones, they would have made a killing. Or if they, you know, if it was this game, but instead of you're the Suicide Squad killing the Justice League, you're just Batman killing the Justice League. Not that Batman kills, but you know what I mean. Batman incapacitates the Justice League. It's a very long title, but maybe it would work. I think that would have sold like hotcakes. But instead, we're already handicapping ourselves with the live service model, which limits you in terms of your storytelling, in terms of your gameplay, because it can't ever end. And from a studio that is so well known for single player narratives, having them make a game that inherently can't end is questionable. I do think if done right and done with enough polish and budget, live service games can be very effective and very profitable for the developers and the companies. Your Fortnite's, your Apex's, your Destiny 2's, I mean, those all have their own issues, but like Fortnite is still a license to print money. And, you know, Apex and, and um, Destiny 2 are as well in their own ways. But I th- once you're on those fan bases, you hear a lot more of the criticism. But from a, a, a large view, if you step back and look at it, these are still very successful and they're still making money. And I'm not really sure what the secret sauce is to guarantee success with these things. But I also know that if you're in the pitch meeting for your new game, maybe don't pitch it as a live service game if it's not necessarily going to fit in that box or if it's not going to fit the story you want to tell or the gameplay mechanics you're trying to implement. But yeah, we'll see. I, I Like I said, I would like to play the Suicide Squad game. I just don't want to pay the full price for it. So if it goes on sale, 
you know, we're talking the twenty, thirty dollar range. Maybe I'll give it a shot, but we'll see. But yeah, what do you think about live service games? Are you a fan? Are there any that you like? Are you staunchly against them? I'm curious because I I am a defender. I'm not sure if defender is the right word. I enjoy them. I can admit that. It's like when you watch a soap opera. You know, it's not necessarily substantive, but it's fun. <laughs> Uh, It's like potato chips. Uh, We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to cover some game reviews of the games that I've been playing lately. We'll be right back. All right, we are back on No Credits Rolled. We were talking live service games before the break. Now we're going to talk some game reviews uh, and you could count this first game as a live service game, and that's Marvel Snap. Now, initially, I only had one game I was going to talk about for this segment, but then I was like, hey, let's 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 fatten it up a little bit. So I threw in one of my favorite games, and that's Marvel Snap. It's a mobile card game. If you know me, I've probably talked about it because I never shut up about this game. It's great. It's from Second Dinner, and I wasn't sure if this game would fit the format of this show because I am constantly playing this game and it's not necessarily something that can end because it's an online, you know, multiplayer thing. You're always just playing against other players. But it is undeniably one of my favorite games of all time. I play it almost every day. I keep up with the patch notes. I listen to podcasts about it. It is just something that I really enjoy. Um, and it's something that I thought, hey, let's throw it in the show. It's my show. I can talk about whatever I want. So... For this game, if you haven't heard of it, you're essentially building your deck with your Marvel characters. You're unlocking characters as you go. There are uh, pools of cards where essentially you have to unlock all the cards in pool one to access pool two, and so on and so forth. I have been playing the game since it came out of beta and launched, but I do think the onboarding process for new players is pretty effective. You know, obviously when you talk about any of these card games, the tough part is, well, if I start playing the game today, am I just going to get demolished by someone that has been playing since day one and has all the latest cards and all the best things? And there's a possibility that you'll get a match like that. But it also is based off of rank, so it'll be put with similar players. And every season, your rank is lowered three tiers. And the base cards in the game, I think you can still make decent decks out of. And there are still cards that are from that base pool that are still in a lot of the most popular decks of the game today. So it's not impossible. There is a little bit of, you know, you might get stomped. It's, you know, I'm just going to be honest. You might get stomped. But the more you play, the more cards you get, and the better at the game you get. You learn a lot more of the synergies. You learn more of how cards work. You learn what all the cards do. And you might start to pick up on, oh, my opponent is playing this deck, so I know how to counter it. But they do a new season roughly like every 30 days, every month. And the new season just started, and this time it's themed around Thanos and his Black Order. So if you've seen the MCU movies, those are like all the alien people that he's with that all die. Um, And I'm excited to see how all these new cards will change up the meta. The last season was all about uh, Planet Hulk, which is one of my favorite comic runs. It's actually one of the first uh, comic runs that got me into comic books at the time. Uh, so, and that's another thing that I like about the game, too, is that they don't just pull from the MCU. There's actually not a whole lot of MCU stuff in Marvel Snap. It's all more off the comics, which is rare, uh, considering how popular the MCU is nowadays. You'd think they'd be pulling more from it, but they do a really good job blending what people know from the MCU, characters people know from the MCU, with characters from the comics that you know, maybe your movie-going fan might not know. Uh, and that's a very small pro But it is something I really like about the game as a comic fan is it's introducing characters that I've never heard of or that other people might not have heard of. And, hey, maybe it encourages you to, you know, read the Marvel Wiki and find out who these people are. And that's not necessarily a gameplay thing, but I think it helps fill out this universe that people might only know from the version we see in the movies. Another pro I have of it, there's no ads. There just aren't. You know, if you play, like, Words of Friends, you're getting pop-up ads all the time. Marvel Snap doesn't have that. And considering it's a mobile game, I think that's pretty crazy. The card art is awesome. Like even the base base designs for all the cards are great. Very detailed. And as you upgrade your cards, they get new effects on them. I think that's cool. There's also a lot of variants, and they have really great artists that are getting spotlighted doing card variants in the game. And I think that's a cool way to bring up these artists and showcase them to an audience that might not have ever heard of them or, you know, had a reason to explore their art. 
No, I do have a lot of pros about the game. There are some cons. You know, personally, I've been feeling the game's getting a little bit stale for me. Uh, there have been a couple meta decks that I just feel like are dominating. And I'm kind of looking for that card or that new deck that's going to shake things up. Because, you know, if if, a, if certain decks are the meta or the top, the best decks, and you don't necessarily like playing them, <laughs> then you're kind of, you can find your own way. You can craft your own deck. But it can be a little annoying uh, facing the same one over and over again. But that's another thing the game encourages. It encourages you to make these homebrews and these unique combos that you might find that nobody else has found yet if you spend the time crossing the wires in your head. But I'm genuinely curious if anybody listening uh, is playing Snap or has played Snap. It's free to download. Again, this is not a this is not an ad. I would gladly be sponsored by Snap if I could. But I highly recommend you check it out. Even There is a little tutorial in the beginning, which no one likes tutorials, but you should check it out, especially if you're a Marvel fan, if you're a card game fan, if you're looking for a mobile game... I highly recommend it. And it's probably something I'm going to come back to on this show a lot just because I enjoy talking about it so much. But anyway, on to the other game, the game that I've been spending the majority of my time with in the week leading up to recording here, and that is the Dead Space Remake. I know what you're thinking. Sam, all you talk about is how you don't play spooky games, and you're talking about another spooky game. And you're right. You're right. Maybe I should uh, (laughs) rescind my stance on those kind of games. Um, cause I am loving the Dead Space remake. It's so much better than I was expecting. It's, I'm having a blast. Um, I am playing it with the sound down. That's always a caveat with these kind of games, but it's a lot of fun. The biggest thing for me with it is the, the atmosphere and the environment of the issue more, the ship you're stranded on, I think is impeccable. I think it's so well designed and so it captures that feeling of fear and tension so well in every single setting on the ship. I figured who I was talking to about it, but I was like, if you just take the camera and you just sit there with your character or, you know, looking at anything on the ship in any environment, you could make it your wallpaper of your computer. Like it, the lighting is great. There's like the vo- like volume fog effects and stuff. And it's, I, I don't know if I've ever played a, a game that does it this well. And maybe it's because I don't play a lot of horror games. Maybe they're, they're a dime a dozen. Uh, but the closest thing it reminds me of is the, the Resident Evil 4 remake, uh, which I really enjoyed as well. Another spooky game that I went into, and I was like, all right, let's give it a shot. A spooky game that turned more action-y the further you got into it. And Dead Space is kind of like that too. You spend a lot of the beginning of the game scrounging and running, but by the end you've got like a flamethrower and a chainsaw gun and a, you know lots of beam weapons. So it's a little bit less tense, because you have like a small arsenal, but the environment still can create that tension despite your, you know, your arm to the teeth because you can go around a corner and you never know when something's going to pop out at you, which is why I have the sound down, but you never feel safe either, which is part of why it's such a great survival horror game. Uh, One thing I want to talk about, uh, the game graphically is also extremely impressive. There's so much detail in every part of it Uh, specifically in your character's armor he's in like a space suit and if you get really close with the camera it you can see writing on it where it's like like a almost like the manual for the suit and it says like unlock on where the helmet connects to the neck like little details like that it makes the world feel so lived in and the ship itself is like its own character like the design of it it's like so jagged and sharp and i'm you know dead space originally came out like 10 years ago so i'm sure I'm extremely late to the boat when it comes to this, but like, it's incredible. (laughs) It's all of it is so well done and so deliberate. Like they knew what they were doing when they made this game. They knew what they were doing when they crafted the ship and, and why it's designed the way that it is. It's, it feels alien, you know, from the very beginning without having the necromorphs running around. Those are the monsters, by the way, they're like zombies, sort of. I mentioned the weapons earlier, uh, you're a, it's like a mining ship. So all your weapons are mining themed, which is cool. It's not just like a pistol, a shotgun, a machine gun. You do have like a pistol and an assault rifle, but the gimmick is that you have to dismember the enemies instead of just like shooting them in the head. And I think that's cool too. It adds a nice little touch that makes the game unique and makes the game stand out. There's also a really great navigation system. And for someone like me that doesn't pay attention, if you just click the right stick, it's all like built into your character's suit. It's the the idea so your character will like 
put out a little pulse that tells you exactly where to go with the trail. Your health is on your spine. The bar for your health is on your spine. Your ammo counts are on your gun. And from what I've heard, that was like one of the first games to do that. And it, it's really, really neat. There are some downsides to it with the camera. Like if you're in a really tight space and you try to pull up your weapon wheel, the, because it's supposed to be displaying in front of your character, it like it could appear like 2D if you turn it and it can get kind of wonky. Um, but overall, I think the design is purposeful and effective. Uh, my biggest complaint for the game is that there is a lot of padding in the back half, like like a lot of padding. Where I was like, "Is this? Can we? Like, is this allowed?" You know, um, two points. I don't want to spoil anything because I recommend you go play it. Uh, it's on Games Pass if you have that. But there are two parts in the back half of the game where you're like, "All right, here we go. We're gearing up for a big fight," and then the game just stops and it's like, "Go do like four to six other things." And then you can do the big thing. And it's like, I was so ready to go. And it, it really does. I don't know how to describe it, but it really does just feel like padding. I think I'm at like seven hours and I feel like I'm really almost to the end. Uh, but then I couldn't talk about it because the show's called No Credits World. But that being said, even the filler can be fun just because shooting the the monsters is so much fun. Uh, there's really great enemy variety. Even now, getting towards the end of the game, they're still introducing new enemy types. And that goes back to that Resident Evil 4 comparison um, where the enemy variety is awesome in both the games. Uh, and, you, you know, you get like a mental logbook of, okay, this is how I defeat this guy. This is how I defeat this guy. And then you combine that with the weapon variety and the weapon upgrades you can do. It's just a lot of fun, you know? <laughs> it's uh, It's nice to play a game that is just fun and gets more fun the more you play it. Uh, and maybe that is obvious <laughs> for video games, but I feel like I, you know, maybe because I play so many multiplayer games or so many different kinds of games where it's like when something hits for me, it's like, wow, like I am just having a blast playing this and I cannot put it down. And it's something I really want to celebrate on this show. That's going to wrap it up for episode three. No credits rolled. I want to know what games you've been playing. Also, make sure to subscribe every week you can to get the show. And until next time, stay safe out there, everybody.